If you have a Bible tonight, we're going to use it a lot. If you don't, um, trusting you memorize the passages I'm going to share out of, that would work fantastic. And I want to talk a little bit, if I can, taking a risk tonight on worship. Is it all right if we talk a little bit about worship tonight? <clears throat> and I'd like to, to offer a new idea. I've been thinking, praying about, talking about worship for a long time. In fact, you know, there have been three revolutions in my life. Uh, one of them was radical grace of God because I grew up in a church where I absolutely knew who Jesus was and I knew he died on a cross, but I kind of thought all the rest of it was up to me. And uh, that's a very hard way to live the Christian life. And uh, it was a big explosion in my life when I came to realize that Christ not only died for me, but that he lives to live in me a life that I could never live apart from him. That was two parts of a whole gospel that I'd been living in half of for my whole Christian experience. And love it half, because half's great. The fact that you're not going to hell, sins are forgiven, that you've been saved by the grace of God, it's a pretty good half. But it's a better whole when you know that you've been changed by the grace of God into a new creation, but it's the life of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to live inside of you to do what you can't do so you can get out of this whole rededication mindset of, I got to keep trying harder to live the Christian life, because trust me, if you could do it, they would have named it the Jeremy life, but it's called the Christian life for a reason. That's because Christ is the only one that can live the Christian life. So if you're trying and failing, guess what? That's normal. He doesn't fail at living the Christian life. So when he lives his life in us, the Christian life is possible for you and for me. That was a blow up moment for me growing up in church. It blew my world up. Second blow up moment for me growing up in church was worship. And it was moving past, you know, the form, the Sunday, the thing, the deal, the whatever, the, all the stuff, and really understanding that worship is a lifestyle. And so we, we've sort of grown up together with that, Chris and myself, and all of us who are hanging around together. And trust me, we love the songs. I mean, obviously, that's part of who we are. Uh, we love the gatherings. That's a part of who we are. We love the expressions. That's a part of who we are. But we just got exploded by this idea that worship isn't songs. It's not seven great songs. That's not worship. Worship is a whole lifestyle lived out to God, a whole lifestyle that reflects the glory of God. Uh, the third big blow up for me was the glory of God, which is still blowing up for me. You know, by the way, when something blows up for you. I'll tell you, what do you mean, three big blow up moments in your life? It's when something so, so blows you away in revelation that it alters not only the experience in the moment, but everything you do for the rest of your life. And on every page of Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter where you are, it's there. And that's these three things for me. The radical grace of God, every page of Scripture. The, the life of Christ in us, the hope of glory, every page of Scripture. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Every page of Scripture, it's all there. Worship, every page of Scripture, and God being central and glorified in everything. Every page of Scripture reinforces that it's all about God, and it's all about His fame, and God's all about God, and God's all about His fame. So when I become about God and His fame, I become about what God is about, and me being about what God is about is about the best thing I can do with the five seconds I get on this planet is to make sure I'm being about what God is about. And trust me, God's about making his name famous to the nations, and he's committed to that end with or without us, folks. That's what he's going to do. <clears throat> so this lifestyle worship's kind of been where I've been, but tonight I want to try a new definition and just ask for the grace of God on our lives tonight that we would see this. Here's a new idea about worship tonight. Worship equals change. That's a new idea tonight. I'll let you chew on it for a while. You might agree, disagree, have another idea, another thought. But here's what I'm thinking. That unless something changes, 
in us, then there is nothing for the world to see and marvel at. And so if there's no change, there's no reflection to cause the world to marvel, which is really what worship is all about. It is about exalting God, but not so much for, you know, propping him up more, because I hate to break it to you tonight, but he doesn't need any propping up, you see. He's sitting on a throne that is called an everlasting throne. So the God we're worshiping tonight, not sitting in a lawn chair, sitting on an everlasting throne throne out of which lightning and thunder come forth. Now that's just, a, that's just a crazy idea, and it's an idea that we need to get our heads around. And I know this is a youth event tonight, and I'm fired up about that because I happen to have a high view of young people, and I'm going to talk to you tonight not as if you're a teenager. I'm going to talk to you tonight as if you're a human being with a brain that functions quite well, I might add, most of the time, when you want it to. And, um, when you're awake, which is not often, but you know, in those moments where you are awake, fantastic brain power, just kidding. I want to talk to you though on a level that, that lets you know that I didn't come here tonight to talk down to you or to hope that maybe one day you'll get a hold of something and become something. I came here tonight because I believe in you right now because God believes in you right now. And there's no age limit on what I'm talking about tonight. There's no age qualifications on what we're talking about tonight. So if you don't get it, it's not because you're 14. It's just because you just didn't want to get it. If you don't get it and live it out, it's not because you're in middle school. And if we just kind of wait till you get to high school, you'll get some more revelation, or maybe to college you'll get a little more revelation, or maybe in the 20s you'll get a little bit more, and then you'll finally understand, you'll finally connect the dots and put the pieces together. That's craziness, and that goes against everything the Spirit of God is about. So if you don't understand, grab onto, and become changed by tonight, it's not because of how old you are. It's simply because you don't want to grab onto it because God is here and he's here for everybody in the building. There might be a seven-year-old in the building tonight who really gets this the most. You never know how God wants to work. And I believe what God wants to do is set us on a course where we understand that the potential is greatness. There is majesty inside of you. And God intends for it to become you and for you to become a display of his greatness to the world. That's what your life's destiny is all about. You, not your youth group, or us at Forward, or the generation, or whatever, you, God's destiny for you is that you would become, not God, but that you would become majestic, that the majesty of God that is in Christ, that is in you, would become you, and your life would become a reflection of wonder, that your life would become wonderful that it would become majestic, that it would become awesome, that it would become like Him. That's the, that's the goal. And there's so few people thinking that way today. There's so few people thinking there's majesty inside of me. That there's that kind of potential in my life. So that's why I break in tonight to the teenage world with a huge challenge. Because it's not about rules and this and you can do this and you can't do that and you know do you listen to Chris Tomlin or Lil Wayne and which is better and you know I'm going to do my whole thing about what you should and shouldn't listen to those talks are for people who do not understand that the potential for majesty is in their life people who need talks on how far can I go in my Christian life before I step over the line and go into no man's land or, or, or really bad land, those talks are for people who don't get it. And that's why I don't think the talks work, honestly. Because I could come here tonight and say, here, here's what we need to do about this area of our morality or this area of our lives. I want to challenge you in this area of what you're listening to or, you know, what's going on in your thought life or blah, blah, blah. And all those things do is create 
boundaries of morality that allow us then to go, oops, I'm doing good or I'm doing bad, instead of saying, hey, blow that all up and grab a hold of this idea. The potential for majesty is residing in your life, and you don't know how long you have to live out that majesty. You're like, well, I've got plenty of time. I'm just in seventh grade. No, you do not have plenty of time. And so you get a hold of this idea, forget about, you know, can you go this far or that far or that far or that far? You start asking the question, are you kidding me? I can live a life as a seventh grader that could show my school the majesty of God? And all of a sudden now I'm in a different conversation. I'm in a different zone now. And I don't need the youth pastor to keep reminding me that listening to this is probably not the best way because I'm on board with the idea that majesty resides in me and I want to live up to that. I want to grow up into that. I want to become that. I want to be drawn up into the potential that's inside of my life. Is anybody tracking with me so far? There's majesty in you, inside of you, and inside of me. So I want to talk about worship as change, and I want to talk about three words. Say them with me. The first one is absence. Okay, we're going to talk about the, the world absent from God and see something kind of interesting about worship over there. We're going to talk about presence. Okay, that, that was powerful. And we're going to talk about glory. Absence, presence, and glory, change, and worship. Absence, presence, and glory, the main three words, and then change and glory. The passage you've heard, I have a hunch, I love. It's mind-boggling. It's found in Exodus 33, and if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to read along with me, beginning in verse 12. Let me paint a picture for you if you don't know this passage. Moses who's leading this people of God through the wilderness, has gone up onto the top of the mountain to meet with God. Everybody knows the story, right? And so he's, you know, he's going to come down ultimately with the Ten Commandments, but he's gone up on the mountain to meet with God, which is a whole other talk for a whole other day, because there's a whole people down below the mountain, and they don't have any interest in going up on the mountain, but Moses does. And Moses has been summoned by God. Okay, come on up on the mountain. And so he's like, all right, I'm coming to meet God. I mean, hello? Forgive me, but this stuff moves me. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a crazy idea to think that, that God said to Moses, okay, we'll come on up here and we'll meet up here on the mountain. Now, we may have been in church too long if that doesn't cause us to go, what? Huh? Flip that. You know, God and us meeting together, that, that's a crazy idea. But that's possible. And it was possible for him. So he goes up to meet with God. They're having this conversation. And this is the way it tracks down. Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You've said, now check out what God's already said. I know you by name. Remember burning bush? And you have found favor with me. So that's already been said. So step one, and here's kind of what I want to get at tonight. Number one, God's already said to Moses somewhere in the past, Moses, I know you and I know you by name. So the God of all creation and you are on a first name basis and you have found favor in my sight. Whoa. Most Christians I know would have bailed right there. That's really all I need to know. God knows my name, and I have found favor with God. That's really all I was looking for in life. Cool, I'm happy, I'm satisfied. I can just go on about my life right now, and I can live my whole life on God knows my name, and I found favor with God. Wow, that's pretty incredible. But apparently that's not all there is, because Moses, he, he said, you've already done that, but he's moving forward. He says, if you are pleased with me, speaking to God, teach me your ways. Okay, anybody prayed that prayer today, yesterday, the day before? That's what you were waking up to, Lord? Teach me 